Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatized by Neville Teller, with Sean Phillips, Hugh Grant, and Beatty Adney. Exactly when and where did the killing begin? Oh, about the events themselves, there was no mystery. It all came out in the trial of the newspapers. But at what moment did the actual murder start to happen? That was what bothered me for such a long time. I needed to work it out. So over and over again, I traced back the events that led to the tragedy. And you know, at last, I think I really did fix on the starting point. Thank you, Sally. We'll ring for you to clear. Yes, madam. So, that's Sally Jupp. Mm -hmm. Pretty young thing, isn't she? All that golden hair. A little too pretty for her own good, Doctor. Evidently. How do you like having a baby around the house again, Eleanor? The dinner party I threw at Martingale. That was the opening scene of tragedy. Martingale. Even in the 50s, it was an anachronism for ordinary middle-class people to be living in an Elizabethan manor house handed down through the generations. Sally's baby doesn't bother you, does it, Mother? Not at all. It's Martha I'm worried about. She needs the help, of course, but she's very conservative. I don't really know what she thinks of having an unmarried mother around her kitchen. I suppose we Maxies were an anachronism. Leftovers from the interwar years. <laughs> How on earth did we survive unscathed into the 1950s? Not that financial problems weren't looming even then. Mother and daughter don't see eye to eye on everything, but once Deborah had come back home after her husband's death, we were as one in scheming and planning. Cutting back here, economising there, employing untrained girls like Sally Jupp to help Martha. Our one aim was to see Stephen through his medical training and preserve his inheritance. We were determined that when Simon, bedridden and nearly helpless in an upstairs bedroom, finally slipped away, Stephen would succeed his father to the house and grounds, just as Simon himself had inherited them from his father. Oh, I shouldn't worry about Martha too much. An extra pair of hands about the place will soon overcome any moral scruples on her part. <laughs> I'm not at all sure that moral scruples ought to be so easily cast aside, Doctor. Ah, but can you afford to take too moral a position, Miss Liddell? After all, as head of St Mary's Refuge, unmarried mothers are your bread and butter. <clears throat> take Sally Jarp. Oh, a case in point, Dr Maxie. A baby and no father to fix an affiliation order on. At least the girl refuses to name him. Oh, yes, it's on practical experience that I base my views. And they are? Well, in a word, I see no reason why a girl who's simply gone after a good time, quite regardless, should receive more consideration from society than a young married mother struggling to bring up a family decently and respectably. Now, uh, a few shillings from society don't go very far these days. This is a Christian country, my dear brother. The wages of sin are supposed to be death not eight bob of the taxpayer's money. Yet, Mrs Risco, that's the position we've reached in this country. And if those seem like revolutionary ideas, then that's even further proof of the decline in our moral standards. <laughs> An ordinary dinner party. Rather dull, really. Yet memory... Selective and perverse now invests it with an aura of foreboding and unease. In retrospect, it's become a ritual gathering of victim and suspects. Not all the suspects, of course. Felix Hearn, for one, wasn't at Martingale that weekend. Make the most of me, Felix, while you can. I can't really see my freedom lasting. Martha will certainly have her out in time. And I don't really blame her. She doesn't like Sally Jupp. And neither do I. Now, I wonder why that is, Deborah, my love. Is the girl perhaps chasing after your precious brother? Don't be vulgar, Felix. <laughs> but to be honest, Stephen does seem rather impressed. 
I think it's because she asks his advice about the baby whenever he's at home. I've tried to point out that he's supposed to be a surgeon, not a paediatrician, but it doesn't stop her. <laughs> You'll see for yourself on Saturday. And who else will be there, apart from the intriguing Sally Jarp? Stephen, of course. And Catherine Bowers. You met her the last time you were at Martingale. So I did. Rather poached egg eyes, but an agreeable figure. And more intelligence than you or Stephen were willing to allow her. If she impressed you so much, then our annual fate is a golden opportunity to give Stephen a break. He was rather taken with her once, and now she sticks to him like a limpet. It bores him horribly. By rather taken, I suppose you mean that Stephen seduced her. Well, he must find his own way out of that. I certainly shan't intervene. But I won't miss your fate. I have a feeling the weekend will be rather interesting. A house full of people all disliking each other is bound to be explosive. Oh, it isn't as bad as that. Very nearly. To start off with, Stephen doesn't like me. He's never bothered to hide it. I think he thinks we're having an affair. I sometimes wonder why we aren't. Well, one good reason is you don't really want to. I certainly don't want to fall in love again. You're right about that. Edward's death. I never want to go through all that again. But an affair, Felix. Darling, Deborah, uh, let me explain. Interrogation at the hands of the Gestapo affected people in different ways. Those that survived, of course. Some emerged determined to devote the rest of their lives to humanity... Others were convinced that life owed them some sort of recompense and they've spent the last ten years grabbing at any pleasure that comes their way. With me it's different. I'm afraid I've become rather suspicious of life. It takes me longer and longer these days to commit myself to anything. I understand, Felix. No, honestly, I do. And by the way, I don't think Stephen does dislike you. Oh, yes, he does. And you don't like Catherine Bowers, which means she dislikes you and will probably extend her feelings to me. Martha and you dislike Sally Jupp, and she, poor girl, probably loathes you all. I suppose that pathetic creature Miss Liddell will be there. A more unsuitable person to run a home for unmarried mothers it would be difficult to imagine. Your mother doesn't like her, that I do know, so all in all this weekend is going to be a perfect orgy of suppressed emotion. Deborah! Colly said you were up here. Sorry I was out. Have you been waiting long? About a quarter of an hour. But I only came here on the off chance. I was having lunch with Felix. I suddenly thought I'd call in at the hospital before starting home. Lovely to see you, big sister. I've spent most of the time looking out of the window. Then you saw her? Yes, Stephen. I did see you and Sally Jupp. You could hardly miss all that golden hair, even from the fourth floor. Deb, I want you to look at something. Here, these tablets. Have you seen them before? Aren't they some of father's? Where did you get them? Sally found them and brought them up to me. She phoned from Liverpool Street to ask me to meet her. She found them in father's bed. How do you mean? I don't understand. She found them between the mattress cover and the mattress, down the side. His drawer sheet was rucked and she was smoothing it when she noticed a little bulge in the corner of the mattress underneath the fitted cover. This is what she found. Ten of them, tied up in a handkerchief. Father must have been saving them for weeks, perhaps months. I can guess why. Does he know she found them? She doesn't think so. Of course, we don't really know if he's still capable of acting independently at all. They may have been there for some time and he may have lost the power to get at them and use them. We can't tell what goes on in his mind. Trouble is, none of us has bothered to try. Except Sally. But, Stephen, that isn't true. We sit with him, we nurse him, but he just lies there... He doesn't seem to notice people any more. He isn't really father. There's no contact between us. I have tried. I swear I have. But to deceive us all systematically and hide away ten tablets one by one, it must have happened months ago. I can't believe he could manage it now, not without Martha knowing. She does most of the heavier nursing after all. Well, he obviously managed to deceive Martha. But I blame myself. I'm supposed to be a doctor. I ought to have thought. At least Sally treated him like a human being. She's very devoted to Father. She seems to be extending her devotion to you. What on earth do you mean? Why come all the way to London? Why not tell Mother about the tablets? Or me? Be honest now, Deb. You haven't done much to encourage her to confide in you, have you? What do you want me to do? Hold her hand? I don't like her, and I don't expect her to like me. It's not true that you don't like her. You hate her. Well, at least she has a very vigorous champion in you. A pity you'll be safely here at the hospital when the trouble starts. What trouble? Why on earth assume Sally's going to make trouble? Because she's making trouble already, isn't she? 
but I suppose you find her less dreary than Catherine. Isn't it time you ended that affair gracefully? How? I'm a coward about these things. I've never found it particularly difficult. The art lies in making the other person believe they've done it. And if they won't cooperate? Men have died and worms have eaten them, but not for love. Look, you'd better take these tablets home. I'll put them in a bottle. Put this in the medicine cupboard in Father's room. And I think it would be wiser if we took Father off the tablets altogether. I'll get a prescription made up in the dispensary. The same kind of drug, only in solution. Give him a tablespoonful at night in water and do it yourself. Just tell Martha I've stopped the tablets. I'll explain it all to Dr Epps when I see him on Saturday. Well, close the door behind you. Oh, you're late. I think that child is starving, poor mate. Where have you been? Well, you won't have to wait much longer, oh, will you, my pet? Oh, Martha, isn't there any milk bottles? There is not. I'm not here to wait on you, Sally Jupp. Please remember that. If you want milk, you must boil it yourself. You know well enough what time that child ought to be fed. Doesn't matter. It won't take long. Sally, there's, uh, there's something I want to ask you. Oh, yes. I'll ask away. Did you take anything from the master's bed when you made it this morning? Anything belonging to him? I want the truth now. Well, it's quite obvious you know I did. Do you mean to tell me you knew he had those tablets hidden away and you said nothing? Of course I knew. I've nursed him for five solid years. Who'd know what he does and what he thinks of if not me? I suppose you thought he'd take them. Of course he wouldn't have taken them. But if you had to lie there year after year, perhaps you'd like to know that you had something that could end all that pain. Something that nobody else knew about. Until his silly little bitch, no better than she should be, come ferreting them out. Oh, very clever, weren't you? But you can give them back to me. And if you mention a word of this to anyone, I'll have you out, you and that brat. I'll find a way, never fear. Oh, I'm afraid you're unlucky. I haven't got the tablets. I took them to Stephen this afternoon. You what? Yes, Stephen. And now I've heard all that silly twaddle, I'm glad I did. Just imagine Stephen's face if I were to tell him that you knew all along. You wouldn't. Why not? Dear, faithful old Martha, so devoted to the family. You don't care a damn for any of them, you old hypocrite, except for your precious master. What? Pet, you can't see yourself. Washing him, stroking his face, cooing to him as if he were a baby. It's indecent. Lucky for him, he's half gaga. Being mauled about by you'd make any normal man sick. All right, my pet. Who's ready for a supper? You're a wicked, evil girl. And you deserve to be dead. The children's three-legged race will start in the paddock in five minutes. All those competing through the paddock, please. Not an easy choice, Mrs Webster. And both prints are the same price. Five shillings each. Why not take them both, Mrs Webster? They make a good pair. The first quarrel and reconciliation. By the same artist, too. Ten shillings, I don't know. Catherine's quite right, you know. They are made to hang side by side. I tell you what, I'll let you have them for seven and six the pair. How about that? Oh. I'd take it if I were you, Mrs Webster. That's a real bargain. You've talked me into it, Miss Buzz. <laughs> well done, Catherine. I'll just wrap them up for you. Deborah, you don't happen to know who donated them to your white elephant stall, do you? I do, but I shouldn't really say. Not ethical. Oh, go on, do tell well, they were sent in by old Mr Mortimer. I think they hung in his bedroom, but now he's on his own. He's shut up the first floor altogether. The house is too much for him. Poor man. Here you are, Mrs Webster. Thank you very much. I'll just take these to the car. Good luck with the stall. This is quite fun, Deborah. I didn't think it would be. Amazing what people want to get rid of. It's even more astonishing what people will buy. Do you think Stephen will be coming by? Shouldn't think so. He's too busy with the horses. I say, Dr. Epps, oh. I've got just the thing for you. Good afternoon, ladies. Are you about to make me an offer I can't refuse? Precisely, <laughs> Doctor. Now, what do you say about this? Isn't this the most practicable winter top coat you've ever seen? Oh. And look, a detachable waterproof lining, oh, ideal yes. for visiting the sick in winter. What a saleswoman. Yes, I must admit it. it, it. Hold on, now. This garment rings a bell. 
Haven't I seen it? I know. Sir Reynold Price. He's seen through your guilty secret, Deborah. All right, I own up. It is Sir Reynolds' contribution. Are you too proud to wear it? Oh, nothing of the sort. Here, let me try it on. Now, what do you think? Perfect. <laughs> you look splendid, Dr. Epps. Well, I'll take it. Oh, how much? One pound. And cheap at the price. Done. Now, I think I'll escape you two sirens before I get even more entrapped in your clutches. What a pair! <laughs> Deborah, why don't we go and grab some tea? The tent seems to be filling up rather rapidly. Good idea. I'm dying for a cup. I think I'll go through the house and get a wash. My hands are filthy. Hey, you! What are you doing in here? Uh, me? Uh, do you mean me? Yes. This is a private house. Sorry, I was looking for the toilet. The lavatory's in the garden. It's very well signposted. Oh, here's a course. I'm sorry. The tea tent was crowded and the noise deafening. A confused clatter of crockery, the babble of voices, and behind it all, the music from the loudspeakers. The concentration of noise was so great that when a dozen conversations faltered and died, it seemed to me as if total silence had fallen. I looked up to see what had happened. Sally Jupp had come into the tent. Sally in a white dress with a low boat-shaped neckline and a skirt of swirling pleats, a dress identical with the one Deborah was wearing. Sally, with a green cummerbund which was a replica of the one round Deborah's waist. The silence seemed profound. Then from the far end of the tent where some of Miss Liddell's girls had formed a small group, there was a quickly suppressed giggling. Only Deborah seemed unconcerned. Without a second glance at Sally, she collected some tea and joined Catherine at a table. How dare she? It's a deliberate insult. Where did she get the dress from? The same place I did. Anyone could buy it who took the trouble to find it. Sally must have thought it worth the trouble. You're taking it very calmly. What would you like me to do? Tear it off her back? There's a limit to the free entertainment the village can expect. Despite this incident, the day was being judged a great success as we gathered in the dining room that evening. French windows opened wide to the ravaged lawn. Uh, these glasses, Mrs. Maxey? That's right, Felix. I'm afraid it's only cider tonight. No superior brand, though. Not far short of Devonshire Scrumpy. Have you ever tried it, Mr. Hearn? It's quite potent. I haven't, Doctor, but I will. Thank you. Anybody else? Eleanor? Thank you. I'll wait till we sit down. Miss Liddell? Not if it's alcoholic, Dr Epps. Well, I'm afraid it is. Then I shall stick with fruit juice. Uh, where do you want the spoons, Mrs Risco? Oh, um, leave them on the sideboard. We'll circulate them with the pudding. I'll have a small sherry, Felix, if you can find it. Of course. Oh, dear, these table napkins. Why can I never get them to stand up straight? Good evening, everybody. Oh, oh. Catherine. Hello, Hello, Mrs Maxie. Hello, Catherine. Isn't Stephen with you? No. No, he's not. I haven't seen him since he was with the horses. I've been in my room. Oh, he probably walked home with Bocock to help with the stabling. Or perhaps he's changing. I don't think we'll wait. Shall we sit down? Who's waiting at table? Where's Sally? Not in, apparently. Martha tells me that Jimmy's in his cot, so she must have come in and gone out again. But, Mrs Magsy, there she is, coming across the lawn. And Stephen's with her. Hello, Dr Maxey. We were wondering where you were. Good evening, Miss Liddell. Come inside, Stephen. I'm glad you're back. Sally, you'd better change into your uniform and help Martha. Do you really think so, madam? Sally! What do you mean? Well, madam, I wonder if a maid's uniform would be entirely appropriate for the girl your son has just asked to marry him. Simon was no better and no worse that night. Yet I stayed on the daybed in his dressing room as if there were a crisis and heard the hours strike one by one through the long vigil of the night. Sleep was impossible as I lived through the scene in the drawing room again and again, so many times that there seemed no second of it I couldn't recall with vivid clarity. Sally Jupp, remember your place. To marry him? Is this true, Stephen? Of course. Stephen? My place? Perhaps you can tell me just what my place is now. It's your place to be polite and grateful, my girl. You've just been intolerably rude to Mrs Maxey. 
Have you forgotten that she took you in, you and your baby? She's given you a home and your keep. Is this how you repay her? Mr. Dell. No, Mrs. Mm. Maxie, this needs saying. Just look at you in that dress. You deliberately chose to embarrass Mrs. Riscoe this afternoon. Please, Miss Liddell, let it pass. No, why should I? Why should any of us? That's the trouble with all of us these days. We turn a blind eye to things most of us find intolerable if truths were told. And look at the result. A generation without morals, without standards, without gratitude. Gratitude? You think I ought to be grateful to you? You certainly should. St Mary's Refuge looked after you when you had nowhere else to turn. Well, just think what I've done for you. I saw you through your pregnancy. I trusted you. I taught you how to live among decent people. And then I found you the best job any girl in your position could hope for. You sex-starved old hypocrite. Don't you talk about what you've done for me. You're not doing it for me or any of us. You're doing it for yourself. You get some sort of perverted pleasure in queening it over us all. Don't think I don't know. And that's not all. There's much more I could tell the village about you if I wanted to. You be thankful I know how to keep my mouth shut. Lying in Simon's dressing room during the long watches of the night, I found myself remembering with uncomfortable vividness Catherine Bower's face, flushed with grief or resentment. Felix Hearn was the only member of the party who seemed to enjoy his dinner. I wasn't sure that the preliminaries hadn't actually sharpened his appetite. He certainly put himself out to ease Catherine's embarrassment. Felix was very amusing when he cared to exert himself, and that night he had, surprisingly, succeeded in producing laughter by the end of the meal. At some point during the night, it rained heavily. At five o'clock, I thought I heard Simon stirring, and I went to him, but he still lay in the rigid stupor produced by the medicine which Stephen had prescribed. At six o'clock... I got up, put on my dressing gown, and made some tea. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mrs. Maxey. Catherine, can I come in? Of course. What is it, my dear? I couldn't sleep any more. I hope you don't mind. Of course not. Come in. I'm just having a cup of tea. Would you like one? Yes, please. To be honest, I haven't slept much all night. The rain kept me awake for a long time and then I woke very early with a headache. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you still got it? I'm afraid so. I don't get them very often now, but when I do, they're agonising. You don't happen to have any aspirin, do you? I'm sure we have some in the medicine cupboard. You're the nurse. Why don't you help yourself while I pour the tea? Thank you very much. Do you take sugar? Just one, please. There you are. Thank you. You know, Sally's announcement came as a great shock to me, Mrs Maxey. It was a great surprise to us all. But I had hoped. I know you and Stephen were quite close at one time, Catherine, but I thought it was all over between you long ago. Well, clearly Stephen thought so too. But you... I still love him. I think I always will. I don't think you will, you know. It may sound a bit unfeeling, but by and large, people get over unrequited love. Yes, but is it really unrequited? That's my difficulty. When we were in love, it seemed so permanent. I can't believe that all we meant to each other has simply vanished into thin air. Perhaps what's happened to Stephen is a temporary infatuation. That's not unknown, is it, Mrs Maxey? I have to find out. Do you see that painting up there? The nude? I was wondering. It seems somehow inappropriate. Do you like it? Well, yes. Yes, I do. You don't know who painted it? No. You don't mean my father? (laughs) Yes, it's a Bowers. That means something these days, though not when I bought it. I never liked your father, you know, but I did think he was an artist. I don't believe your mother thought so. Oh, poor Katie, one day he simply packed up and left you both. Yes. Katie and I had been very close. When she fell madly in love with Christian Bowers, nothing could persuade her that he wasn't in love with her. Nothing. Her friends could see it. I could. I tried, but she talked him into marrying her. You know the result. I suppose so. Ask your mother about unrequited love. See what she tells you. 
I will. One other thing, Catherine. You may find this strange, but one of the reasons I love having you as a guest here at Martingale is simply because of the pleasure that painting has given me over the years. Can you believe that? Come in. Good morning, madam. Yes, Martha, what is it? It's Sally, madam. She's overslept again. Oh, she's quite impossible. She's almost never down on time these mornings. Well, wake her up. But I called her and she didn't answer. And when I tried the door, I found she's bolted in. Bolted in? Well, I can't get in, madam. I'm sure I don't know what she's playing at. Have you knocked really hard? Well, hard enough to wake her. Well, you'd better try again. Sally had a busy day yesterday. We all did. People don't oversleep without reason. As Catherine and I sat there finishing our tea, a curious feeling, the imminence of evil, took hold of me. When I replaced my cup in the saucer, it was with a clinical detachment and a kind of wonder that I saw my hand wasn't shaking. It's no good, madam. I can't make her hear me. When the baby's awake, he's whimpering in there, but I can't make Sally hear. Sally! Sally! Are you there? Why is the door locked? Sally! Wake up! Oh, my God, madam, something's wrong, something's happened. You may be right. What shall I do? What shall we do? Stay here, Mrs Maxie, don't worry. I'll fetch your son. I won't be a minute. Keep calm. Oh, the door's too solid. I'll never break it down. We'll have to get through the window. The ladder in the outhouse will do. I'll get Felix Hearn to help. You all wait here. We'll be as quick as we can. Oh, madam, something terrible's happened, I'm sure of it. Who locked the door? It locked on the inside. Didn't she usually lock her door? Of course not. Who ever heard of a maid locking herself in? I could always get in to shake her away. Hello, Mother. Stephen told me what's up. He and Felix are getting the ladder. Oh, where on earth have they got to? It's bound to take a little time, but they won't be long. I'm sure she's all right. She's probably still asleep. Well, she can't have slept through all this. We've made enough noise to waken the dead. To say nothing of little Jimmy in there. I wonder if she's inside the room at all. What do you mean? I expect she won't be there. She's gone. And what about the locked door? Knowing Sally, my guess is that she wanted to do it the spectacular way and got out through the window. She seems to have a penchant for making scenes, even when she can't be present to enjoy them. Oh, Deborah! No, really! Here we are, shivering with apprehension, while Stephen and Felix lug ladders about, and the whole of the household is totally disorganised. I can see her planning the whole thing, just as she planned that spectacular entrance to the tea tent yesterday. To say nothing of her outburst last night... She's compulsively theatrical and thoroughly disruptive. She wouldn't leave her baby. No mother would. This one apparently has. <coughs> Felix? What's happened? Let me in. <coughs> Dear heaven, it can't be. She's dead. <gasps> Oh, my God! Oh, 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 my God! Oh, 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 oh. I felt, rather than heard, the thud of Martha's retreating footsteps. No one followed her. Deborah and I pushed past Felix's restraining arm and moved silently as if under some united compulsion to where Sally lay. The window was open, and the pillow on the bed was blodged with rain. Over the pillow, Sally's hair was spread like a web of gold. Her eyes were closed, but she wasn't asleep. From the clenched corner of her mouth, a thin trickle of blood had dried like a black slash. On each side of her neck was a bruise, an indelible sign of where the life had been choked out of her. In episode one of Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Teller, Sean Phillips played Mrs. Maxey, Hugh Grant, Felix, Beatty Adney, Deborah, David Thorpe, Stephen, Una Beeson, Catherine, Kate Binchy, Miss Liddell, Philip Anthony, Dr. Epps, Jill Graham, Martha, Melanie Hudson, Sally, and Linda Polan, Mrs. Webster. The director is Matthew Walters. The window was open, and the pillow on the bed was blodged with rain. Over the pillow, Sally's hair was spread like a web of gold.
From the clenched corner of her mouth, a thin trickle of blood had dried like a black slash. On each side of her neck was a bruise, an indelible sign of where the life had been choked out of her. Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Turner, with Sean Phillips, Hugh Grant, Beatty Adney, and with Robin Ellis as Adam Dalgleish. Eleanor, it's Bill Thornton. Oh, Bill, thank you for phoning. How are you coping? Uh, I hope my policemen aren't being too much of a nuisance. No, no, they're being most considerate. Uh, how's Simon taking it? I'm afraid he's in no condition to be involved at all. A blessing, really. He's in a sort of waking coma most of the time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Eleanor. Uh, look, there's no point in having the Chief Constable as a friend if he can't do something to help. I'm going to ask Scotland Yard to take over the investigation. They'll probably send up Detective Chief Inspector. What do you say? Thank you very much, Bill. I really am most grateful. Oh, it's you, Dalgleish. <laughs> Long time no see. I was wondering who'd pick the short straw. Manning, how have you been? Oh, well enough. <laughs> Pretty stretched, though. With three full-scale inquiries on the go all at once. Now there's this. Well, that's probably why the old man decided to call you in. Glad to help out. Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Martin. Hi. Pleased to meet you, Super. <laughs> it's a nice-looking place, this. Uh, Elizabethan, or so they tell me. Hi. It's been in the family for hundreds of years. Oh, by the way, Dalgleish, they're all together in the drawing room. Do you want to see them now? No, the body first. Right. The living will keep. <laughs> Fill me in on the details. I've done all I can here. We'll take it away now, if that's all right with you. Oh, uh, yes, yes, Doctor, certainly. Simple enough, medically speaking. Manual strangulation by a right-handed person standing in front of her. Sexual interference? No, doesn't mean sex wasn't the motive, though. Nothing like finding a dead body on your hands to remove the urn. Quite so. Tell you more after the post-mortem. Well, I'll go and get the stretcher party. Nasty business for a Sunday morning. That door was bolted on the inside, you know. Was it? <laughs> the classic locked door murder, sir. Uh, not this time, Sergeant. No. <laughs> um, exit, entrance two, probably, was by the window. I mean, look, you can see the marks on the stack pipe on the wall. And it looks as if he fell the last five feet or so. Not a difficult climb for anyone reasonably fit. And uh, Sally Jupp, she was last seen alive... At half past ten last night, carrying a late-night drink up to bed, up uh, this cup. Yeah, she didn't finish it. Could it have been... Oh, funny you should ask. In fact, some dope has gone missing. The older Mr Max is an invalid. A bottle of sleeping pills has wandered from his medicine cupboard. Of course, we'll analyse what's left in this cup. And anyway, the post-mortem will show if she drank any and if it was drugged. How about the attack? Any obvious motive? Oh, could be... There's no details, but I've heard gossip. Ah, gossip. Yeah, Miss Liddell showed up earlier on to take the baby away. She was here at dinner last night. It was quite a meal, by her account. Apparently, the son and heir, Stephen Maxey, had just proposed to this Sally Jupp, and she'd blurted it out to everyone. You can imagine the reaction. The maid and an unmarried mother with a six-month baby to boot. A motive for the family, I suppose. Yes, it'd be rather interesting to see how the family choose to present last night's events. Mm. I have a feeling the person we're after slept under this roof. We sat in the drawing room, waiting. Stephen and Catherine Bowers not too far from me, Deborah close to Felix Hearn, Martha on an upright chair against the wall sat ramrod stiff and apart from the rest of us. She seemed to regard the whole thing as a personal insult. I couldn't help thinking about the effect of all this on my two menfolk, Simon and Stephen. In the midst of the nightmare, there was some comfort in the thought that Stephen would get over it, the young always do, and that Simon, thank God, would never know. Sorry for keeping you waiting. As I told you, the Chief Constable has asked Scotland Yard to handle the investigation. This is Detective Chief Inspector Dalgleish. He is in charge of the case as from now. My first thought as Adam Dalgleish stepped into the room was, where have I seen that head before? And then I knew. An engraving by Dürer, was it in Munich? Portrait of an unknown man. Dalgleish, was that Dürer brought to life? How do you do? How Hello. do you do? Tall, dark and handsome. Not what I expected at all. Quite an interesting face, really. Poor Stephen. 
He looks shattered. Supercilious looking devil. He's taking his time coming. I suppose the idea is to soften us up. Or else he's been snooping around the house. Uh, this is the end of privacy. Thank heaven father's beyond it. Interrogation. That'll bring back the past. Well, Dal Gleish will discover that the Gestapo left me with three fingernails and a disinclination to answer even nice English Bobby's questions. I understand that the small room next door has been put at my disposal. I'd like to see you in there separately, please, and in this order. Dr. Stephen Maxey, Miss Catherine Bowers, Mrs. Maxey, Mrs. Deborah Risco, Mr. Felix Hearn and Mrs. Martha Bultitaft. Um, until the interviews are over, I must ask everyone to stay in this room. If you need to leave, there's a woman police officer and a constable outside in the hall who can go with you. Could you lead the way, please, Dr. Maxey? Yes, it's through here. Does anyone get the feeling we're all going to be beaten by the headmaster? I'd better start by telling you that Miss Chapp and I were engaged. I proposed yesterday evening. There's no secret about it. Yes, I've been told. Please accept my condolences. <sighs> I don't feel I've any right to condolences. I can't even feel bereaved. I suppose I shall when the shock's worn off. We were only engaged yesterday. Now she's dead. Still hasn't sunk in. And what were your relations with Miss Chubb before yesterday evening, Dr Maxey? <sighs> if you're asking whether we were lovers, the answer is no. I was sorry for her, I admired her, and I was attracted by her. I have no idea what she thought of me. Well, she accepted your offer of marriage. Not in so many words. But she told my mother and everyone that I'd proposed, so I assume she meant to. After you'd finished dinner on Saturday night, what happened? Oh, well, we had coffee in the drawing room. At about nine, my mother suggested they start counting the takings from the fate. I decided to go out. I asked my mother to leave the south door open for me, and I went to see Sam Bocock. He used to be my grandfather's groom. He lives alone in the cottage at the far end of the home meadow. I often go there. We talk and listen to music. I stayed quite late last night. How late? Can't remember. He may be able to help. Just after eleven, I think. I walked back, came into the house through the south door, bolted it and went to bed. That's all. You came straight back here? Yes. That means you would have been back in the house when... It's only five minutes' walk, but I didn't hurry. I suppose I was in bed by 11.30. And in the morning... When you were woken up, what did you do? Went with Felix Hearn to get the ladder. We carried it between us, though it's quite light. Hearn went up first, I followed. The window was open, but the curtains were drawn. There's a wide window ledge. Apparently Sally kept a collection of small glass animals there. I noticed they'd been scattered and most were broken. Hearn went over to the door and pulled back the lock. I stood looking at Sally. I saw at once she was dead. Take a look at this, Dr Maxey. What is it? Three splinters of glass. They were found in the outhouse opposite Miss Jupp's room, where the ladder's kept. Do you know what they are? Could be part of a broken watch glass, I suppose. Or part of one of the smashed glass animals from Miss Jupp's room? Perhaps. I see you have a small piece of plaster across your right knuckle. What's wrong? Uh, just a graze last night. I, I must have brushed it against the bark of a tree. Don't remember doing it. I thought I'd put a bit of plaster on before I went to bed. Show me. There you are. Ah, that looks like a cut to me. Or it could, of course, be a scratch from a fingernail. In which case you'd expect to find blood and skin under the nail which did the scratching. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just can't remember how it happened. Is that all? No. Uh, I want to be perfectly clear about this south door. Yes. It leads directly to the flight of stairs which go up to Miss Jupp's room. That's right. So she was almost in a self-contained flat. Once the kitchen was closed for the night, she could let someone in without anyone knowing? I suppose so. As the south door was left unbolted for you last night, anyone could have gained access to the house through that door while you were out? Well, yes. Would you be prepared to swear that it was unbolted when you got back from Mr Bocock's cottage? <laughs> of course. I couldn't have got in otherwise. Dr Max, you do realise how important it is to establish the exact time you bolted that door? Yes. Yes, of course. Now, you've just told me you came back to the house just after 11, bolted the door and went to bed. Now, I'll ask you again, and please think very carefully before you reply. What time did you bolt the south door? Well... Actually, 
It was 33 minutes past 12 by my watch. I was in bed by about half past 11, as I said, but I couldn't get to sleep. At 12.30 I suddenly remembered that I hadn't locked up, so I got out of bed and did so. No doubt very careless of me, but if there's a law against forgetting to lock up, I should like to hear of it. 12.33? Yes. I can quite see how it happened. No one is kinder than Stephen Maxey. The girl just took advantage of him. I knew he couldn't have loved her, really. He'd have told me before anyone. If they'd really loved each other, he could have relied on me to understand and release him. Do you mean you were engaged? Not exactly an engagement, Inspector. No ring or anything like that. But an understanding. It was taken for granted. Stephen has a long way to go before he can think of marriage. And there's his father's illness to consider. Tell me about the early hours of this morning, Miss Bowers. I understand you were with Mrs Maxey. That's right. I couldn't sleep, and I had a headache. I went to the dressing room where Mrs Maxey was spending the night and asked for some aspirin. Did she give you some? She told me to find it for myself in Mr Maxey's medicine cupboard. It was while I was looking for it that I saw the bottle of sleeping tablets. Samay is the brand name. It was written on the label. You're quite sure it was Samay? I'm a state registered nurse, Inspector. I know a bottle of Samay when I see it. So it was in the cupboard at... At seven o'clock this morning. And when Stephen and I went to look for it about two hours later, after we'd found Sally's body, the bottle had vanished. Tell me about finding the body. When Martha came to tell Mrs Maxey that Sally hadn't got up, we thought at first she'd overslept. Then Martha came back to say that her door was locked. As you know, Dr Maxey and Mr Hearn got in through the window. We waited on the landing. Felix, what's happened? Let me in. Dear heaven, it can't be. She's dead. <gasps> oh, my God! Oh, oh, my God! But she can't be. She was all right last night. Stephen, what's happened? See for yourself. She's been strangled. Oh, dear God. We've looked at her long enough. Cover her face. No. It's best if we don't touch anything before the police get here. You know, there's something strange about all this. Strange? That's an odd way to describe murder. What do you mean? There's no sign of struggle. In my experience, people don't usually allow themselves to be strangled to death without putting up something for a fight. Oh, Felix, what can all that matter? She's dead, isn't she? Oh, yes, she's dead, Mrs. Maxey. I wonder. You think this... Cocoa, I suppose it is... You think it's drugged? I don't know. I think it's possible. But... But that's my cup. It's the one I always use. Everyone knows it. What's it doing up here? Oh, my God. I think I'm going to be sick. All right. Leave it to me. Move on to when you, Mrs Maxey, and her son found that the sleeping tablets were missing. Well... I'd picked Jimmy up from his cot. He stopped crying, and I followed the other two into Mr Maxey's dressing room. Stephen went straight to the medicine cabinet. He said, it's gone. I asked what he meant, and he told me about the ten tablets that Sally had found in Mr Maxey's bed and that Mrs Risco had put back into the cupboard. That was the first I'd heard of it. I was able to tell him that the bottle had been there when I went to the cabinet for aspirin earlier on. I see. And then? There isn't much more to tell. As I took Jimmy away to change his nappy, Stephen was just starting to phone the police. No one seemed much concerned with the baby, so I took matters into my own hands and phoned Miss Liddell. She agreed to take him till things were sorted out. She came round by taxi, and by then the police had arrived. The rest you know. That's very clear and very useful. Thank you. Now, Just a few more questions. Oh. Yes? Yes, the earlier part of the night... Tell me what happened from about ten o'clock onwards. Let me see. Well, I helped Mrs Maxey and the others count the day's takings from the fate. Miss Liddell and Dr Epps left at about ten-thirty. Mrs Maxey and I went to the kitchen. Martha had gone to bed, but she'd left a saucepan of milk on the stove and a tray of cups on the kitchen table. Did you notice that Mrs Risco's was missing? As a matter of fact, I did. It's Wedgwood. Very distinctive. She'd gone out to the garden with Felix Hearn a little earlier, and I thought she must have come in without anyone noticing. It never occurred to me that Sally might have taken her cup, though, of course, it's just the sort of thing she would do. 
She hated Deborah, Mrs. Risco. You've heard about the affair of the copy dress. Deborah pretended to take it calmly, but I could see that really she could have killed Sally. Oh, I, I didn't mean... Uh, quite, quite, sir. And then? Well, we made our drinks and took them up to the dressing room, which was where Mrs. Maxey said she'd sleep that night. I helped her make up Mr. Maxey's bed and get him comfortable. Then I went to bed. Uh, and what time was this? Um, a quarter past eleven. You may find this part rather strange. Something happened? That scene before dinner, it, it had been a great shock. I just couldn't believe that Stephen and that girl were engaged. Dinner itself was a nightmare, everyone behaving as if nothing had happened. Of course, the Maxies never do show their feelings. But no one said anything to me, though in a way I was the one most affected. So what did you do? Well... I couldn't sleep and I couldn't bear to lie there all night without knowing the truth. The natural thing seemed to ask Sally. I put on my bedside lamp and looked at my watch. And the time was? Three minutes to midnight. That didn't seem too late to have things out, not in the mood I was in. So I went to Sally's room. Yes, Miss Bart? Her door was locked, but I could see the light through the keyhole. I knocked and called to her. She must have heard me because the bolt was suddenly shot home and she stood in front of the keyhole cutting off the light. I knocked again, but it was obvious she wasn't going to let me in. So I went back to my room. I see. Straight back? Not quite. I thought I'd see Stephen. I just had to know the truth. The light wasn't on in his room, so I knocked and went in. I felt that if only I could see him, everything would be all right. And was it? He wasn't there, Inspector. The bed was turned down for the night, but he wasn't there. I'm surprised you bother to ask, Inspector Delgleish. You must know that I would disapprove strongly. Even though Sally Jupp's affection for your son could have been genuine? I'm paying her the compliment of assuming it was. But what difference does that make? I'd still have disapproved. They had nothing in common. He'd have had to support another man's child. It would have hindered his career. And they'd have disliked each other within a year. Of course I disapprove. I'm sorry to discuss what must seem no one's business but your own, but you must see its importance. Naturally. It provides a motive for several people, myself particularly. But one does not kill to avoid social inconvenience. I admit I intended to do all I could to stop them marrying. I've no doubt we should have been able to help Sally short of welcoming her into the family. There must be some limit to what one does for these people. This uh, business of the cocoa... If, as I assume, it turns out that Miss Jupp was drugged, there are two possibilities. She could have taken it herself, or someone else drugged her. Who else in the household drinks cocoa? I don't know what Martha drinks, but none of the family uses it. The milk must have been all right. You and Miss Byers used it to make your own drinks. So the drug was either crumbled into the dry cocoa or dissolved into the hot drink sometime after Miss Jupp made it. Not by anyone other than Miss Jupp, Inspector. We saw Sally carrying it up to her room. Who do you mean by we? Dr Epps, Miss Liddell and myself. I was seeing them out. It was about 25 past 10. We were in the hall. Sally came from the kitchen end of the house and went up the main staircase carrying the blue Wedgwood cup. No one said anything. Was it usual for her to use that staircase? No. The back stairs lead directly to her room. I think she was trying to make some kind of gesture. You say you saw that Miss Jupp was carrying your daughter's cup. Did you mention this to your guests or to Miss Jupp? What did you expect me to do, Inspector? Tear it from her grasp? What an exciting world yours must be. <laughs> Sometimes it is, Mrs Maxey. For example, we found the empty cocoa tin in the dustbin a little while ago. We'd have been able to tell if the drug had been put into the dry cocoa. If someone hadn't rinsed out the empty tin and destroyed the inner paper lining. So at about 9.30, Mrs Risco and I came in here, where Mrs Maxey and the others were counting the money taken at the fete. We told them we were going out for a little wander in the garden. What did you talk about? Hasn't Mrs Risco already told you? I'd like to hear your account. I asked Mrs Risco to marry me. And did she accept? Charming of you to be interested, Inspector, but inexplicable as it must seem... She was not enthusiastic. Oh, God, Felix, I can't. I can't, not after Edward. 
You don't know what I went through watching him die. Loving him so much. Feeling so helpless. Darling, Deborah, that was a tragedy. You had a chance in a thousand. We must all die in the long run, but people get married just the same. They gambled on life being kind to them on some years of happiness together. I'm not prepared for that gamble. Not yet, Felix. I'm not ready. And nor is Stephen come to that. There's been enough talk of marriage in this family. God, how I hate that girl. How long were you in the garden? Till about 10.40. Then we came in. And then? Mrs. Risco offered me a whisky, which I refused. She went to the kitchen to get her own nighttime drink, but came back in a minute or two saying she'd changed her mind. Uh, then I went to bed and slept reasonably well for me. Did you kill Sally Jupp, Mr. Hearn? No. Not that I'm aware of, at any rate. Have you any idea who did? No, and I doubt if I'd tell you if I had. I presume someone came through the girl's window. That bolted door must be a great disappointment to you, Inspector. You can hardly visualise a member of the family pounding up and down a ladder to get in and out of their own house. I know the maxage up engagement must excite you, but you don't need murder to get out of and welcome engagements, or the mortality rate among women would be astronomical, don't you think? After the discovery of Miss Chupp's body, what did you do? I went to see if Mrs Baltertaft was all right. She seemed stunned and kept repeating that Sally must have done herself in. I pointed out that it was anatomically impossible to strangle yourself, at which point she burst into even louder sobs. Uh, then Miss Bowers arrived with the child. I see, sir. Oh, uh, one thing, Mr Hearn. Mrs Riscoe says you spent almost the whole night in her bedroom, that you slept together. How sweet of her. But it puts me in a delicate situation, doesn't it? You'll have to make up your mind which of us is lying. Thank you. I've already done so. Employing an unmarried mother? <laughs> It'd never have been thought of in the old days. So it was an experiment. What sort of a girl was Miss Jupp? Were you satisfied with her? Satisfied enough. At first, anyway. What made you change your mind? She began to get cheeky. She started acting as if she was the mistress of the house. Well, I suppose she was beginning to think that she might be mistress here one day. Then she was out of her mind. But Dr Maxie did propose to her on Saturday. Yeah, well, I know nothing about that. Yeah, Dr Maxie couldn't have married Sally Jupp. Well, you can't now. Someone made certain of that, didn't they? Hmm. Those tablets found in Mr Maxie's bed... She didn't find any tablets. She got them out of the bottle. Yeah, it was all a game to get attention. Well, I'd do all the heavy nursing. If there was anything hidden in that bed, believe me, I'd have found it. One other thing, Mrs Bultituft. There was an empty cocoa tin found in the dustbin. That's right. I found it on the kitchen table this morning. I took out the inner paper and put it in the stove and then I rinsed out the tin. Why do that? Madam doesn't like dirty tins in the dustbin. We rinse out all the used tins that Martin Gale always have done. We won't keep you long, Miss Liddell. Sergeant Martin and I are here, of course, about the death of Sally Jupp. Oh, dreadful business, dreadful. She stayed here for the last five months of her pregnancy, you know, and came back to us when she'd had the baby. You must have got to know her very well, Miss Liddell. Did you like her? Like her? What can I say? If you'd asked me last week, I'd have said she was an excellent worker and a most deserving girl. But now... I can't help wondering if I was wrong about her. You mean because of the scene with Dr Maxie? Oh, I was never more shocked in my life, Inspector. Of course she had no right to accept him. But she looked positively triumphant when she stood in that window and told us. Oh, I shall always blame myself. I recommended Sally to Martingale, you know. So you think Sally Jupp's death is the direct result of her engagement to Stephen Maxey? Well, it looks like that, doesn't it? I agree that her death was highly convenient for anyone who disliked the proposed marriage. The Maxey family, for instance. Oh, what a terrible thing to say, Sergeant. Terrible. <clears throat> of course, you don't know the family as we do, but you must take it from me that that suggestion is fantastic. Miss Liddell, we've spoken to the Proctors, Sally's next of kin. Can you tell me why you phoned Mr Proctor on Saturday morning? What? Their oh, daughter I... said she spoke to you, Mum. Me? Phoned Sally's uncle? Mm. No, there's some mistake. I haven't been in touch with the Proctors since Sally first went to Martingale. What on earth would I phone Mr Proctor about? That's what I've been wondering. Uh, your private papers, Miss Liddell, documents about the running of the refuge and things like that, where do you keep them? Oh, um, over here, 
here, Inspector, in this drawer. Naturally, I keep it locked. The key is in this little compartment. Anyone who wanted could find that very quickly. Do you mean that Sally might have pried about among my things? Oh, yes, I see it now. That was why she liked to work in here. Oh, that docility, that politeness. So much pretense. And to think I trusted her. She must have been laughing at me all the time. I suppose you think I'm a fool too. Well, I may not be very clever with figures and accounts, but I've done nothing to be ashamed of. And they've told you about that scene in the dining room, I suppose, but I've done nothing wrong. You can ask any member of the committee. Sally Jupp could pry as much as she liked. A lot of good it's done her. Poor girl. Poor little girl. And she was so happy yesterday evening, Stephen. How do you know, Vicar? Did you speak to her after the fete? No, not after the fete. I get so muddled about times. But, but no, no, it wasn't yesterday. It was Thursday evening. We walked up the road together and I asked about Jimmy. She was so happy. Told me about her marriage and how Jimmy was to have a father. So very, very happy. You must have the wrong day, Vicar. Really? Why? I asked Sally to marry me on Saturday. Saturday at 7.45. She couldn't have told you about it on Thursday. Oh, uh, is that important? Dalgleish will probably think so. Dr. Maxey, do you recognise this? Yes. It's the bottle of Samay from Father's Drug Cupboard. There are seven tablets here. Do you confirm that three are missing? Well, naturally I do. I put ten in. Could I ask where that bottle was found? Why not? It was buried in the lawn in the area used for the treasure hunt. The person responsible was considerate enough to mark the place with one of the named pegs lying around. Who's peg? Curiously enough, Mrs. Risco, yours. Your peg, your cup with drugged cocoa. Why? Why, indeed. If anyone can answer that, I'll be in the business room for an hour or two. Uh, Mr Hinks, isn't it? Oh, oh, yes. Perhaps you could spare me a few minutes now. And perhaps one of you will let me know when Dr Epps arrives? You mean you think she was doped first? That's bad. The missing Simei tablets indicate that, Doctor. This projected marriage would have been calamitous for the Maxes financially, which gives several people in the household an interest in seeing it didn't happen. At the cost of killing a girl? Making a child motherless as well as fatherless? What sort of people do you think we are? I only deal in facts, Doctor. Stephen never told me about those tablets, Inspector. Well, not much chance. With the fate and all that, I suppose. Probably thought I wouldn't be much help. I've known his father, Simon, for 30 years. We ought to know your patience, but... Uh, I didn't even go up to him very much recently. Just left the prescription week after week. Stephen wouldn't overlook carelessness like that. Who else in the village has been taking some A? Well, I, I, I can look it up when we get to the surgery, but it, it's not a common prescription. I can remember one or two, Sir, Sir Reynold Price is one, and, and... Good God! What is it, Doctor? Here. In my coat pocket. A bottle of... Of what? Some Some tablets. Oh! <laughs> no mystery, Inspector. This is Sir Reynold Price's stuff. This was his coat. How did it come into your possession, Doctor? Well, I bought it on Saturday at the Village Fate. Rather as a joke between myself and the stallholder. And the stallholder? That was... who? Oh, that was... Uh, Mrs. Risco. In episode two of Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Teller, Robert Ellis played Dalgleish, Sean Phillips, Mrs. Maxey, Hugh Grant, Felix, Beatty Adney, Dabra, David Thorpe, Stephen, Una Beeson, Catherine, Kate Binchy, Miss Liddell, Philip Anthony, Dr. Epps, Jill Graham, Martha, John Fleming, Manning, Steve Hodson, Sergeant Martin, John Church, Thornton and the Reverend Hinks, and John Baddeley, the police doctor. The director is Matthew Walters. Good God! What is it, Doctor? Here. In my coat pocket. A bottle of... Of what? Somme. Somme tablets. Oh! oh! No mystery, Inspector. This is Sir Reynold Price's stuff. This was his coat. How did it come into your possession, Doctor? Well, I bought it on Saturday at the Village Fate. Rather as a joke between myself and the stallholder. And the stallholder? That was... Who? Oh, that was... Uh, 
Mrs. Risco. Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Tanner, with Sean Phillips, Hugh Grant, B.T. Adney, and with Robin Ellis as Adam Dalgleish. Mandy dawned colourless and bleak, an uncertain week stretching ahead. Deborah had ordered half a dozen newspapers, whether as a gesture of defiance, I couldn't help wondering, or out of genuine curiosity. Chief Inspector Dalgleish had locked Sally's door but kept hold of the key, and he made frequent visits there. He offered us no explanation of what he found or what he hoped to find. At midday, the telephone rang for the twentieth time that morning. This time, Sir Reynold Price. The whole thing's disgraceful, my dear lady. The police have been here, too, you know. Wanted to know about some pills Epps had prescribed months ago. Extraordinary. That, that Inspector Chappie seemed to think I ought to remember how many I took and what happened to the others. I ask you. I told him, I said, I've got better things to do. How very tiresome for you, Sir Reynolds. I'm afraid this business is causing a lot of trouble to everyone. Yes, raking up a lot, too. They were asking about that spot of bother we had at St Mary's two years ago. I wonder how they got on to that. Well, that Dalgleish fellow wanted to know why you weren't on the committee. Told him you'd resign when we had the trouble. Then he asked why we hadn't got rid of Liddell at the time. I said to him, my, my dear chap, you can't just chuck a woman out after 25 years' service. Anyway, it wasn't as if there was actual dishonesty. Muddle, yes, but anyway, I, I told the man we'd had Liddell before the committee, then sent her a letter confirming the new financial arrangements. Did he ask why I resigned? Well, I told him, I said you thought we should have turned the home over to one of the national associations. Well, I just thought it was time we handed over a difficult job to trained and experienced people. That's what I told him. You'd lost confidence in the Liddell woman. You may well have been right. But Lady Price was keen on the home, practically founded it, so I, I, I couldn't just hand it over. I had no doubt that Dalgleish's mind was now busy with a new theory. Yet how was it possible? The mugs and cups for those late-night drinks were certainly standing out by ten o'clock, but Miss Liddell had never been out of my sight. We'd stood together in the hall with the doctor and watched that glowing, triumphant figure carrying Deborah's cup up to bed. Whatever Miss Liddell had made of Sally's accusations and half-threats earlier that evening, she couldn't have done anything about it, not possibly. I dismissed the thought, and succumbed instead to the insistent demands of the household routine. Monday was when I visited the village stores. I saw no reason to alter the custom. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Maxey. I didn't expect to see you here today. Life must go on, Mr. Wilson. I suppose you're right. It's a terrible business, though. The village is full of it. Well, that's only natural. Here you are, Mr. Wilson. It's all on the list. Would you put it together for me, please? Of course, ma'am. I've uh, got my own thoughts about it, Mrs. Maxey. Have you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed, ma'am. Derek Pullen. That's who they should be looking at. Derek Pullen. I'm afraid I don't know what you mean, Mr. Wilson. Oh, I'm saying nothing, mind you, ma'am. Let the police do their own work, I say. But if they bother you up at Martingale, just ask them where Derek Pullen was going last Saturday night. You ask them that. <laughs> he passed here at twelve or thereabouts. I saw him myself from the bedroom window. Timid, spotty boy. But why should that have anything to do with Sally Jupp's death? Oh, I'm saying nothing, Mrs. Maxey. Derek Pullen. I know what you mean... His mother comes to the Women's Institute. And doesn't his father work for Sir Reynold on one of his farms? That's the lad. Mr Wilson, accusations like that could harm many innocent people. If you have information, I think you should give it to Inspector Dalgleish. It was well, the vicar sent me up here. I told him what had happened and he said for me to tell you. Quite right, Johnny. Well, then? You a real Scotland Yard detective? Well, don't I look like one? Not much. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. The ones in the films are much more exciting. Well, excitement gets rather spread out in real life. Still, something rather exciting happened to you at the fete, didn't it? No, nah, it was boring most of the time. Tell me. Well, our Sunday school class was supposed to be helping with the teas and the washing up. You know, I was among the first there, and we did quite a bit. Then the others started rolling up and we thought it was their turn. So I took some sandwiches and cake and went off to Bocock's stable. What, to see the horses? Nah, to go up to the loft and read my comic. And then? After a bit, I heard voices down below. There were two of them. What did you do? I hid, of course. I got behind a bale of straw in case they decided to come up. And did they? 
Yeah. Just as well you hid then? Yeah. And what happened then? Oh, not much. I only had one bun left by then, so I just sat and nibbled it. I tried to make it last till they went away. And these visitors of yours, did you see them? One of them was Sally Jupp. I saw her hair as she came up through the trap door. Are you quite sure, Johnny? Well, certain. I knows her. I knew her quite well. And the other person? It were a man, but I never saw his face. And what were they saying? They were arguing. I don't rightly know what about. I couldn't hear all that good because of the hay. I did hear someone say, 40 pound. 40 pounds. Anything else? Well, I remember Sally saying, keep your head, because it sounded a bit funny. Keep your head. Keep your head, she says, and watch for the light. And then? Then they left. Sally opened the trap door and went down first, and the man went after her. When I looked out, the trap door was just coming down. It must have been the man doing it, because Sally had already gone down the ladder. But all I saw was a hand in a brown glove. A hand in a brown glove. Now, that really is exciting, Johnny. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear sister here departed, we therefore commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, isn't that Sally's die. aunt? Ensure a certain hope of the resurrection Talking to Miss Liddell. Life Surely that's the woman who identified Christ, Sally at the inquest. Who shall arrange I think you're right. Felix, let's drive her home. The buses are dreadful body. at this time of day. It might be worth having a word with her. I'll bring the car around. All things to him. How do you do, Mrs. Proctor? You're Sally's aunt. I recognise you from the inquest. That's right. I shouldn't have come, really. Mr. Proctor wouldn't like it if he knew. I must get back quickly before he comes home. Perhaps I can help. Mrs. Risco and I were wondering if you'd like a lift. There'll be a long wait for a bus. Well, that's really very kind of you. If you're sure it's no bother. It'll be a pleasure. Look, here she is. Hello, Mrs. Proctor. Do get in the front next to me. There you are. This is very good of you. Hope I'm not taking you out of your way. Not at all. You live just outside Canningbury, don't you? We go through there on our way to London. This must be an awful time for you, Mrs Proctor. I won't be able to tell Mr Proctor I've been to the funeral. She's made her own bed, let her lie on it. That's what he says. You can't blame him. We treated her and Beryl just the same, as if they were sisters. There was never any difference between them, never. I'm sure there wasn't, Mrs Proctor. Never. We brought her up decently. Wasn't always easy. She wasn't an easy child. Well, I used to think it was the bombing, but Mr Proctor, he wouldn't have that, even though it was a V1 that did for her mum and dad. But other kids came through the war all right, used to say. So that's how you came to bring her up? Well, there wasn't anyone else, really. Poor little mite. And till she was ten, she was the only child. And then Beryl came along. But we never made any difference between them. Now this. The police asked who the man was, but of course we couldn't say. The, the man who killed her? No, no, the father of the baby. Though I suppose they thought he might have done it, but we couldn't tell him anything. I don't mind telling you. Why should I? I did go out for a walk last Saturday night. I often do. I've got accountancy exams coming up. I like to take a bit of fresh air before I go to bed. Now think, Derek. Did your walk take you past Martingale? What if it did? I'd like you to take a look at this envelope. It's addressed to you, Mr Derek Pullen. Yeah, it's mine. It's from a pen friend of Venezuela. You can see from the stamp. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Where did you find it? In Sally's room. It's not the stamp that interests me, Derek. It's the writing on the back. Turn it over. Those three dates. Is that your writing? Yeah. What do they mean? Well, about a month ago, she asked when I could meet her. I jotted down some dates for her. She used to lock her door and come down the drainpipe, didn't she? We found her palm marks on the pipe. All we did was sit in the old stable block and talk. Just talk? Well, 
We walked in the garden once or twice. We didn't make love, if that's what you was thinking. I suppose all policemen have dirty minds, but she wasn't like that. What was she like? Well, I think she was lonely. She missed the other girls at St Mary's. <laughs> she was a wonderful mimic. I could almost hear Miss Liddell talking. That day she went up to London... You looked after the baby, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I took a day's leave from the office. It was all above board. But she could have left him at Martingale. Mrs Bultitaff would have looked after him. Why all the secrecy? Well, Sally liked it that way. She liked things to be secret. I think that was half the thrill in sneaking out at night. Those glasses, Derek, they aren't your normal ones, are they? What happened to the ones you usually wear? I... I... I lost them. That is, I, I, I broke them. I'm having them mended. Did you break them at the time you got that bruise over your eye? Yeah, yeah, I, I knocked into a tree. <laughs> Did you just? The trees round here seem particularly hazardous. Dr Maxey grazed his knuckle on one, I'm told. Could it have been the same tree, I wonder? I suppose the police asked a lot of questions about where you were on Saturday night, Mrs Proctor. Oh, I told them. I was at home with Beryl. I remembered all about Saturday, all right. It was a funny day, really. It started so oddly. Well, Miss Liddell phoned us in the morning to talk to Mr Proctor. Beryl answered. But Miss Liddell hadn't been in touch with us for months. Not since Sally took her new job. I expect the police asked Mr Proctor where he was on Saturday night. We weren't likely to forget. That was the night he had his accident. He wasn't home till twelve and he was in a proper state. His lip all swollen and the cycle bent. He'd lost his watch too. Good heavens. How did it happen? He came off at the bottom of a hill, somewhere Finchworthy way. He was coming down fast and someone had left broken glass in the road. Of course, it ripped up the front tyre. Landed in a ditch, he did. Might have been killed. Must have been terribly worrying to see him in that state. Oh, it was. Well, he'd been worried anyway. He was so late. Half past eleven, I'd gone to bed. I must have slept a little, but I got up when I heard him. It was midnight already. His face looked awful, streaked with blood. Oh, dear. And he was shaking all over. Poor chap. Well, I made him a cup of tea while he had a bath. It must have been half past twelve before we were in bed. He's still shaken up by it even now. I bet he is. And then to have the police arriving next day to tell us about Sally. No, we shan't forget that night, Nuri, I can tell you. Only one thing, Martin. I can think of half a dozen oddities in this case. Soda? Oh, no, no, not for me, sir. Quite right, too. The only way to savour a malt or any other whisky if come to that is to take it neat. Thank you. Well, what do you think? Oh, it's very good indeed, sir. It's most unusual. <coughs> the case, Martin. Oh. Tell me, what is it that struck you as particularly odd? Well, it's why Dr Maxey went to all the trouble of fetching Mr Hearn to help him with a ladder. It isn't very heavy. The quickest way to the stable block would have been down the back stairs. Instead of that, Maxie goes off to find her, and it's almost as if... as if he wanted a witness to the discovery of the body. That's certainly a possibility. Oh, Sam Bocock did confirm Dr Maxie's story to some extent. No, <laughs> Sam Bocock would confirm anything the Maxies said. You <laughs> heard him. They're good people up at the house. He'd maintain that at the judgment seat. Yeah, I thought him honest, sir. Of course you did, Martin. You're a countryman. I'd have liked him better if he hadn't looked at me with that half-pitying expression you sometimes see on old country folk. No doubt with your background you can explain it. I wouldn't try, sir. Just as well. I don't think I'd like the explanation. No, we're not likely to get anything very helpful from Bocock. Well, we've got something, sir. Remember he told us he'd seen young Johnny Wilcox slipping out the tea tent at about ten past four. And that means the meeting in the stable loft took place... Before 4.30. Yes, and that fits in with Sally Jupp's subsequent movements, including her appearance in the tea tent and a duplicate of Mrs Risco's dress. Yes. She must have changed after that meeting in the loft. No one saw her in it before. And there's another funny thing, sir. Why wait till then? She must have had the dress some time. Yes, perhaps something said during the meeting led her to do it. Or perhaps it was tied up with this curious business of her marriage. You mean the vicar's story? Can we believe him, sir? Why not? According to him, Sally Jupp knew on Thursday that she was going to be married, yet young Maxie only proposed on Saturday night. Yes, that is odd, sir. Talking of Dr Maxie's love life, Martin, I haven't shown you this yet. It arrived yesterday morning. Posted from Bexhill-on-Sea. 
Dear Sir, I think it my duty to inform you that a Mr. Maxey stayed at this hotel last May the 24th with a lady he signed for as his wife. I have seen a photograph in the evening clarion of the Dr. Maxey who is mixed up in the Chadfleet murder and who the papers say is a bachelor and it is the same man. I would be grateful if my name and the name of my hotel, which has always catered for a very good class of person, could be kept out of this. Yours faithfully, Lily Burwood. Mrs. I sent young Robson down there. He had a couple of photographs with him taken at the fete. Mm. They confirmed a rather interesting little theory of mine. Any idea who young Max's partner in sin was? Would it be Miss Catherine Bowers, sir? Full marks, Martin, full marks. Well, that was nearly a year ago, sir. Is it still going on? Unlikely, but it's a complication. Miss Bowers may easily have been hurt by what happened. Mm. I think she's desperate to marry Dr. Maxey, and her chances have now increased since the removal of Sally Jupp. Yes. So, what do we make of our Mrs. Proctor? Poor woman. Completely under the thumb of that husband of hers. But she's certainly given us something to think about. Do you really want to go on with this detection business? Why ever not? Only that you might discover facts you'd prefer not to know. Such as that a member of my family is a murderer. I didn't say that. You've been very careful not to, Felix. But I'd prefer honesty to tact. It's what you think, isn't it? Speaking as a murderer myself, it's a possibility. You mean the resistance? That was war. Anyway, you didn't kill women, did you? I killed two. At the time, it seemed necessary. Well... I suppose killing Sally Jupp seemed necessary to someone. Then why not leave it to the police? If we start interfering, there's no knowing what the consequences might be. At the moment, the case is wide open. Stephen and I got through Sally's window, so could almost anyone else. The only thing connecting this crime with Martingale is those sleeping tablets. And they needn't be related to it. Other people had access to the stuff. No, the most likely interpretation a jury would put on this case is that someone known to Sally got through her window and killed her. Who knows? She may have admitted gentlemen callers that way on previous occasions. Curiously enough, I can't believe that. I'd like to, for all our sakes, but I don't believe Sally was promiscuous. I never liked her, but I don't want to buy safety for me or the family at the cost of blackening the poor little devil's reputation now she's not here to defend herself. I think you're right, but there's no need to make that Dalgleish fellow a present of your opinions. Let him reach his own conclusions. This whole case may run into the sand if we keep cool heads and our mouths shut. That Samay is the greatest danger. Yeah, and the hiding of the bottle seems to connect it to the murder. Even so, it was your cup, not Sally's, that the drug was put into. Anyone could have done it. Even me. Even you. It could have been put there by Sally. She may have taken the mug to annoy you. I think she did. But she may have put the drug into the cocoa simply because she wanted a good night's sleep. It wasn't a lethal dose. In which case, why was the bottle hidden? Either because someone believed the drug was connected with the murder and wanted to hide the fact, or because someone knew perfectly well that it wasn't and wanted to implicate the family. You in particular, since your stake was used to mark the hiding place. There's a pleasant thought for you. Felix... If they never solve this crime, can you really imagine us living on, happily at Martingale? Don't you ever feel that you must know the truth? Honestly, now, don't you ever convince yourself that Stephen did it? Or I? You? With those fingernails? <laughs> never. Her neck was heavily bruised, but it wasn't scratched. Stephen's a possibility. So are Catherine and your mother and Martha. So am I. In fact, the excess of suspects is our greatest protection. Let Dalgleish take his pick. Well, I pick Catherine. It isn't likely, though. I can't see her capable of murder. And the rest of us are? Even Mother? She particularly, if she thought it necessary. Hello? Is that Mrs Proctor? Yes. Yes, it is. This is Stephen Maxey speaking. Hello? Are you still there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Mrs Proctor, would you rather not talk to me? Shall I speak to your husband? Uh, no, there's no need for that. Mr Proctor doesn't want to talk about Sally. What do you want? Uh, it's quite simple, really, Mrs Proctor. I'd like to know where Sally was working when she became pregnant. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Oh, I 
don't mind letting you know that, but it'd be best if Mr Proctor doesn't know you phoned. You, you won't tell him, will you? Uh, I promise. It was the Select Book Club in London she was working for at the time. In the city, uh, Falconer's Yard. You're Stephen Maxey, aren't you? Saw your picture in the Echo. People are saying you killed Sally Jupp, did you? No, I did not, Miss Mulpaz, and neither did any member of my family. Well, that's reassuring. Now, what can I do for you? How long did Sally work here? Oh, about three years. I want to know about her. It's the child, really. Now he's without a mother, it seems important to find his father. You're meddling a bit, aren't you? Why not leave it to the police? They've been here on the same tack. The police have been here? Of course. What did you expect? Cheer up. You might beat them to it. Not that I can help much. I told the police all I know, but I could see it wasn't getting them very far. You couldn't suggest who the father might be? Not at all. We had no man on the premises at the time. Still don't. She certainly got herself pregnant while she was working here. But don't ask me how. What was she really like, Miss Molpaz? You should know. You were in love with her. <sighs> if I had been, I'd be the last person to know. But you weren't? I wanted to go to bed with her. Would you call that love? I suppose not. I wouldn't really know, never having felt more than that for any woman. I'd settle for that if I were you. I doubt you'll ever feel much more. Your kind don't. What did I think of her? Let me see. Sally Jupp was pretty, intelligent, uh, ambitious, sly and insecure. Sly? What made you think she was sly? I've got eyes in my head. We're rather a collection of has-beens in this office, let's be honest, shall we? But she was clever, our Sally. Yes, Miss Titley, certainly, Miss Croom. Can I get it for you, Miss Melling? Demure as a nun and respectful as a Victorian parlour-maid. She had the poor fools eating out of her hand. They bought her birthday and Christmas presents, and then they began vying with each other for her favours. In no time she had them in a tizzy of jealousy. It all played havoc with the work. What happened when Sally became pregnant? Nothing. No one knew. She left when she must have been about four months. Frankly, it was a relief. So you've no idea who the man was or where she could have met him? Not at all, except that they met on Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings? Yes, I got that from the police. We don't work on Saturdays, but apparently Sally told her uncle and aunt that we did. She came up to town every Saturday morning as if coming to work. A neat deception. Oh, she was a clever little liar. And see where it got her. Were you surprised to hear of her death? At first. But when I thought about it, I was less surprised. She seemed to be a natural murderee. What did surprise me was the news that she was an unmarried mother. She seemed too careful, too scheming for that kind of trouble. Oh, uh, Dr Maxey? Dr Maxey? Hello, Collie, what's up? A message for you, Doctor, from a Miss Catherine Bowers. Please ring home. It's urgent. Stephen? Thank God you've rung. Look, can you come home at once? Why? Is it Father? Your father? No. No, it's Deborah. What's happened? Someone's tried to kill her. Deb, are you all right? What happened? Good afternoon, Dr. Maxey. It's all right, Stephen. I'm OK. Well, what happened? Where's Mother? She's upstairs with your father, Stephen. She spends most of the day with him now. We told her Inspector Dalgish was making a routine visit. There's no need to add to her worries. What about Deborah? Will someone tell me what happened? Would you examine her throat, Doctor, and let me know what you think? I'd prefer not to. Dr Epps treats the family. I'm asking you to look at her throat, not treat it. This isn't the time to indulge in spurious professional scruples. Do as I say, please. <sighs> Very well. Hmm. Fairly extensive bruising. No nail scratches and no thumb marks. He grasped the neck with both hands. But the larynx is almost certainly untouched. In other words, a rather amateur effort for our brutal killer? If you care to put it like that. I do care. How can we believe that the person who killed Miss Jupp couldn't do better than this? What do you think, Mrs Risco? I'm sorry you're disappointed, Inspector. Perhaps next time he'll make a better job of it. I suggest that this assailant knew his job rather well, knew where to apply pressure and how much pressure to apply without causing harm. I must say you seem to be taking it very coolly. If Mrs Risco hadn't managed to shake herself free and scream, she wouldn't be alive now. Oh, I'm treating the attack very seriously, I assure you. 
Where were you last night, Miss Bowers? Helping to nurse Mr. Maxey. Mrs. Maxey and I were together for the whole night. And Dr. Maxey was in London. This attack has certainly happened at a convenient time for you all. Did you see this mysterious strangler, Mrs. Risker? No. I wasn't sleeping very deeply. I think I was having a nightmare. I woke up when I felt the first touch of his hands on my throat. I could feel his breath on my face, but I couldn't see him. When I screamed, he made off through the door. I turned on the light and screamed again for help. I was terrified. Somehow my dream and the attack had merged together. Have you any idea how this person got in? It could have been through one of the drawing room windows. Mr Hearn and I went into the garden last night and must have forgotten to lock it. Uh, Martha mentioned that she found it open this morning. So it comes to this. You and Mr Hearn take an evening walk in the garden of a house where there has recently been a murder and leave a French window open when you come in. In the night, some unspecified man comes to your room, makes an inexpert attempt at strangling you for no apparent motive, and then vanishes. Your throat is so little affected that you are able to scream. You're not suggesting Mrs Riscoe tried to strangle herself, I hope. Those bruises can't have been self-inflicted. So who did inflict them? Do you really suppose that a jury wouldn't believe that this is related to the murder? Oh, I don't think a jury will be asked to consider that possibility. I've nearly completed my investigation into Miss Jupp's death. What happened last night has made no difference to my conclusions. I think it's time the matter was settled, and I propose to take a short cut. If Mrs Maxey has no objection, I want to see you all together in this house at eight o'clock tonight. Did you want something of me, Inspector? Ah, Mrs Maxey, I should like to see everyone here at eight o'clock this evening, please. Suddenly I sensed someone behind me in the doorway, and I turned. It was Martha. She stood white and shaking, her mouth opening and shutting soundlessly. The young man behind her stepped past into the room. He was very tall, over six feet, and his fair hair cut short was bleached by the sun. A rucksack was slung over his shoulder, and I noticed he carried a brand-new airline bag in one hand. He dominated the room with the power of his animal health and virility. It seems I've given your maid a bit of a shock. I'm uh, sorry to butt in like this, but I guess Sally never told you about me. The name's James Ritchie. Sally will be expecting me. She never told me what sort of job she's got exactly, and I don't want to cause any uh, inconvenience. But I've come to take her away. I'm her husband. In episode three of Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Teller, Robin Ellis played Dalgleish, Sean Phillips, Mrs. Maxey, Hugh Grant, Felix, B.T. Edney, Deborah, David Thorpe, Stephen, Una Beeson, Catherine, David Holt, Derek, Jilly Mears, Mrs. Proctor, Susan Sheridan, Johnny and Mrs. Burwood, Steve Hodson, Sergeant Martin, John Fleming, Wilson, Jonathan Adams, Sir Ronald, Linda Polan, Miss Malpass, John Church, the Reverend Hinks, and James Telfer, Ritchie. The director is Matthew Walters. Did you want something of me, Inspector? Ah, uh, Mrs. Maxey, I should like to see everyone here at eight o'clock this evening, please. Suddenly I sensed someone behind me in the doorway, and I turned. It seems I've given your maid a bit of a shock. I'm uh, sorry to butt in like this, but I guess Sally never told you about me. The name's James Ritchie. Sally will be expecting me. She never told me what sort of job she's got exactly, and I don't want to cause any uh, inconvenience. But I've come to take her away. I'm her husband. Cover Her Face by P.D. James. Dramatized by Neville Teller with Sean Phillips, Hugh Grant, B.T. Edney, and with Robin Ellis as Adam Dalgleish. Sitting quietly in that drawing room in later years, I would often see again in my mind's eye that gangling and confident ghost from the past, and sense again the shocked silence which followed his words. 
That silence could only have lasted a few seconds, yet in retrospect it seemed as if minutes passed, while we all gazed back at him in incredulous horror. Someone had to speak. It was Deborah. Sally's dead. Didn't they tell you? She's dead and buried. They say one of us killed her. What? What in God's name are you saying? Come with me, Mr. Ritchie. You too, Dr. Maxey, if you don't mind. Explanation somewhere else, I think. In the business room, perhaps. But what happened to Sally? For Christ's sake, tell me what happened. This way, please. Poor devil. I must get back to my husband. Catherine, perhaps you'd come to help. Of course, Mrs. Maxey. I don't suppose Martha will be much use at present. She seems totally unnerved by all this. I think we're all rather shaken. Felix, when Stephen is finished with Inspector Dalgleish, I think he should come to his father. Deborah should come up too when she's recovered. Perhaps you'd tell her. Yes, of course. Uh, How long do you think it'll be? Not long now, I'm afraid. No need to tell the inspector. His plan for tonight can stand. It'll all be over long before eight o'clock. Yes? Mrs. Proctor? Yes? My name's Dalgleish. Oh, you're the inspector from Scotland Yard. You're looking into... That's right. Is your husband at home? You'd better come in. Thank you. This way. Through here. Uh, Victor, dear. Inspector Dalgleish is here to see you. Mr. Proctor. I think the inspector wants to talk to me in private, Beryl. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, of course, Victor, dear. I'll just... um... Mr Proctor, certain documents have been passed to me. Documents? Concerning claims made by you to a national charity. One of them. It seems you represented your niece Sally Jupp to be a war orphan without means. I suppose I should have mentioned the 2,000 quid... But that was capital. Capital left in trust for her, money that you'd spent. Well, I'd fed her, hadn't I? I had to bring her up. Capital left in trust for her to inherit when she was 21. Did you ever tell Miss Jupp that her father had left her this money? At the time, she was only a baby. Afterwards, well, there didn't seem any point. Because by then, the trust money had been converted to your own use. (laughs) I told you. I had to use it to keep her. I was entitled to. We were the trustees, Beryl and me. And she had the nerve to refer to her rights. We fed and clothed her all those years without another penny. Except for the three grants from the Help Them Now Association. Mr Proctor, were you in the grounds of Martingale House last Saturday? I didn't go to the fete. I was out cycling all day. Hmm. I'd like you to look at these two photographs. They were taken on Saturday afternoon at Martingale. So what? Only some kids? It's not the children who interest me, Mr Proctor. It's that figure there, see, in the background. Not much doubt, is there, Mr Proctor? Oh, all right. I better tell you. I was there. Sherry, anyone? Actually, Felix, could you pour me a large whiskey? I've had about as much as I can stand today. Not quite, I'm afraid, Deb. Don't forget that dog leash fellow's coming back at eight. Oh, God. You'd have thought he'd have the decency to leave us alone this evening. Where's Mrs Maxey? Walking back to the vicarage with Hinks. They'll be arranging Father's funeral, I suppose. What a day. I still haven't grasped all the details. This man, Ritchie, was married to Sally, I take it. So it seems. They met while she was working in London. Got married in secret about a month before he went to Venezuela on a building job. A short-term contract and excellent pay. But why on earth didn't she say... Why all the mystery? Apparently he wouldn't have got the job if the firm had known. They had a strict rule, single men only. But Sally was mad keen to get married before he went. Richie thinks she liked the idea of putting one over on her aunt and uncle. A pity he didn't make sure she wasn't pregnant before he left. Perhaps he asked and she lied. I didn't inquire. None of my business. He was a chap who'd returned home to find that his wife had been murdered in this house, leaving a child he never even knew existed. I don't want a half hour like that again. Well, this explains a lot, of course. It's Sally's chat with the vicar on Thursday, for instance. What she must have said was that Jimmy was about to have a father. Hinks assumed she was talking about getting married. We all did. But she was engaged to you, Stephen. 
She accepted you? No, no. I asked her to marry me. She never said she would. And that's all she came out with last Saturday, remember? Well, madam, I wonder if a maid's uniform would be entirely appropriate for the girl your son's just asked to marry him. Sally adored a mystery, and this was one at my expense. No. She was in love with Richie, all right. He showed us her letters. No doubt about it. He was pathetically anxious to let me know how much in love they were. None of this would have happened if Sally had told the truth about her marriage. It's asking for trouble to pretend about a thing like that. How did Richie get in touch with her? Through Derek Pullen. He sent his letters enclosed in an envelope addressed to Pullen and he handed them over to Sally at pre-arranged meetings. She never told him they were from her husband. I don't know what story she concocted, but it must have been a good one. He was pledged to secrecy. <laughs> Sally knew how to choose her dupes. Mm, she liked amusing herself with people, but they can be dangerous playthings. Obviously, one of her dupes thought the joke had gone far enough. Wasn't you by any chance, Maxie? You always were an offensive bastard. Ah, an inspector calls. Now is the hour. Or almost. He's a few minutes early. Inspector Dalgleish had hinted that his investigation was nearly over. It seemed essential to me that we heard his conclusions, and I wanted nothing to stand in the way of the meeting he had asked for. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sergeant Martin and I are very grateful to you for agreeing to meet us. Did we have much choice? You're under no constraint, Mrs Risker. I thought you might want to know how far we've got with the investigation. Of course we want to know. Have you reached any conclusions? That's the main thing. Yes, Dr Maxey, I have reached certain conclusions. Well? Before I disclose them, we'd like to share some of the thinking that led us to reach them. I'm afraid this is a journey we're not going to enjoy. Bear with me, Mr Anne. Are you all right, Mrs Maxey? Would you like a glass of water? Thank you, Catherine. I think I would. It's been a long day. Allow me, Mrs Maxey. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. There was nothing straightforward about Sally Jupp's death. The evidence pointed in two different directions from the start. She'd been strangled suddenly and with considerable force and by someone using their bare hands. All this suggested a crime committed on impulse. But then... What about the drugged cocoa? That took planning and a good deal of premeditation. Perhaps two people tried to kill her. Separately and on the same night? No. That stretches credulity to the limit. I dismissed that idea almost at once. We weren't the only ones to hate her. What about Miss Liddell? It's all over the village that Sally had found something out about her and was threatening to tell. I can hardly see poor old Liddell climbing up stack pipes or sneaking in at the back door. You can't seriously imagine that she'd set out to kill Sally with her bare hands. She might, if she knew that Sally was drugged. How could she know? She was leaving the house with Dr Epps as Sally took the cup of cocoa up to bed and don't forget it was my cup she took. The sommeil must have been put in later. It couldn't have been. She went straight to her room. What chance was there? It doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense if the drugging and the strangling are connected. You have another explanation? Suppose this drugging wasn't an isolated incident. Suppose someone had been doping Sally's evening drink regularly. Someone who knew that she was the only one to drink cocoa. So the tablets could safely be put into the cocoa powder. But why? Let's assume someone in the house had suffered more from Sally than anyone realised. Someone who wanted to discredit her with Mrs Maxey. To complain if she consistently overslept. Martha? Martha? Of course. She could always get at those sleeping tablets. But why on Saturday night? After that scene at dinner, Mrs Maxey had more to worry about than Sally getting up late. And why did Martha hide the bottle under Deborah's name peg? I thought she was devoted to the family. So did the family. Why did she leave the drugged cocoa powder for Sally that night? Quite simply because she didn't know about the proposed engagement. She wasn't in the dining room at the time and no one told her. But as soon as Sally's body was found, she was in a blind panic. She thought she'd killed Sally with the drug. She ran to Mr. Max's room, took the Samaya and hid it. Dear heaven, it can't be. She's dead. <gasps> oh, my God! Oh, oh, oh my God! Oh. While the rest of you stood around the bed, Martha's one thought was to hide the bottle. She ran to the garden with it, hid it in the first soft earth she found, and hastily marked it with the nearest peg. It happened to be yours, Mrs. Risco. And then, Sergeant... And then, sir, she went back to the kitchen, emptied the remaining cocoa powder and the lining paper into the stove, washed out the tin and put it in the dustbin. Exactly. 
And I believe that the next thing that happened was that Mr. Hearn came into the kitchen to see if Martha was all right. Isn't that so, Mr. Hearn? I did look in on her. She seemed stunned and kept repeating that Sally must have killed herself. I pointed out that that was anatomically impossible, and that seemed to upset her more. She burst out sobbing. Relief, I suspect. I doubt if Martha actually admitted she'd been drugging Sally. She didn't. Not to me. That doesn't mean you didn't guess. I suspect you coached her in what to say to the police. In fact, you've been quite ready throughout this case, Mr. Hearn, to allow the police to be misled. Towards the end, you went a step further and actually faked an attack on Mrs. Risco. That was my idea, Inspector. I made him do it. I may have guessed about Martha, but she didn't tell me and I didn't ask. It wasn't my affair. <laughs> no, it wasn't your affair. That's been the attitude of you all throughout, hasn't it? Don't let's pry into each other's affairs. If we must have a murder, let it be handled with taste. Even your efforts to hamper the police would have been more effective if you'd bothered to talk to each other. That fake attack while Dr Maxey was safely in London, it was a pretty poor effort at shielding him. But it wouldn't have been necessary at all if Dr Maxey had told you that he had an alibi for the time of Sally's death. And young Derek Pullen, sir. Exactly, Sergeant. He needn't have tortured himself wondering if he ought to shield you, Dr Maxey. If you'd bothered to explain to him what you were doing with a ladder in the garden on Saturday night. I suppose there's no objection to us knowing what you were doing with the ladder? Of course not. I was bringing it back from outside Bocock's cottage. We'd used it during the afternoon. One of the balloons had got caught up in his elm. I didn't want to leave the ladder there. The old boy would have carried it back next day by himself, and it's too much for him at his age. I wasn't to know I'd find Pullen lurking about in the old stables... Out he steps from the shadows like an avenging fury and accuses me of exercising some kind of droit de seigneur with Sally. I told him to mind his own business and he lunged at me. I'd had about as much as I could stand, so I struck out and knocked off his glasses. All pretty vulgar and stupid. And as soon as he heard of the murder, I suppose he put two and two together and assumed you'd use the ladder to climb up to Sally's room and kill her. It's a pity you didn't tell us about all this earlier, Stephen. That poor boy could have been spared a great deal of worry. Dr. Maxey had his reasons for keeping quiet. He was trying to protect the family, weren't you, Dr. Maxey? You wanted the police to think there'd been a ladder within easy reach of Sally's window all evening, and you didn't want us to know that the ladder hadn't been returned before 20 past 12. That's why you lied about the time you got to bed, isn't it? If Sally was killed at midnight by someone under this roof, you wanted as many suspects as possible. Something like that. You've already eliminated two of them, Dr. Maxey. To add to Mrs. Bulditaft, yourself and Mr. Pullen. So it wasn't Pullen? How could it have been? He certainly hadn't killed her when he spoke to me, and he was in no condition to do so afterwards. And she was already dead by the time you arrived at Martingale from Bocock's cottage. So it wasn't you. How do you know she was dead then? All anyone really knows is that she was alive at half past ten and dead by the morning. Not really. There's the forensic evidence. And two people can put the time of death much closer than that. One is the murderer. But there's someone else. Come in. Oh, it's you, Martha. Yes? Mr Proctor's here, madam, for the inspector. Now, look here, inspector. I've got to have protection. Protection? Who from? That Richie fellow, of course, Sally's husband. He's been round my own threatening me. Drunk, if you ask me. It's not my fault if she got herself murdered, and I told him so. I won't have him upsetting my wife. My daughter was there too. All that shouting, it's not nice in front of a child. I had nothing to do with this murder, as you very well know, and I want protection. I remember you. You were in this house on the day of the murder. Hey, you, what are you doing in here? Uh, me? Uh, do you mean me? Yes. This is a private house. Sorry, I was looking for the toilet. The lavatory's in the garden. It's very well signposted. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. You'd better come and join the prayer meeting, Mr Proctor. I assume you're interested in hearing who killed your niece? Don't be a fool, Stephen. Keep him out of it. So I'm not to stay? Oh, you'd like to pin it on me, wouldn't you? All of you. Don't think I don't know. If she'd been poisoned or knocked on the head, I'd have been in Queer Street all right. But one thing you can't pin on me is a strangling. And here's why. The scrawny, red-faced little man raised his gloved right hand in a curiously triumphant gesture. We stared in a sort of fascinated horror as he peeled off the glove. Did you lose your hand in an accident, Mr Proctor? In the bombing. They can do wonders with artificial limbs these days. 
This hand lets Mr Proctor lead an almost normal life. But one thing he certainly can't do with it is strangle someone. He could be left-handed. He could, Miss Bowers, but he isn't. And it was quite clear that Sally was killed by a strong right-handed grip. It was Mr Proctor's hand which young Johnny Wilcox saw closing the trap door in the stable. Then they left. Sally opened the trap door and went down first, and the man went after her. When I looked out, the trap door was just coming down. It must have been the man doing it, cos Sally had already gone down the ladder. But all I saw was a hand in a brown glove. Who else would be wearing leather gloves on a hot summer day? You were quite right, Mrs Riscoe. Mr Proctor was in Martingale that afternoon. Oh, what if I was? Sally asked me to come. She was my niece, wasn't she? Oh, come now, Proctor. You aren't going to tell us this was a social call. How much was she asking? Forty pounds. That's what she was after. I'm much good at her doing now. She wanted the money because her husband was coming home, and she intended to get it by threatening to expose her uncle to his employers. Expose what? None of your business. You might have dared her to do her worst, I suspect, Mr Proctor, if she hadn't used one particular phrase. She talked about her rights. What she meant exactly, or what she suspected, we'll never know. But for reasons we needn't discuss here, the remark made you rather uncomfortable, Mr Proctor. Isn't that so? And she saw it. Oh, she was sharp, all right. I agreed to give her the money. She had it all worked out. I was to get the cash and bring it to her that night. She made me follow her into the house and up to her room. That's when I met you, Mrs Riscoe, on my way back down the stairs. She'd shown me the back door and said she'd open it for me at midnight. I was to stay in the trees at the back of the lawn until she switched her light on and off. That was to be the signal. She was pulling your strings for the fun of watching you dance. <clears throat> Poor Sally. She had to have drama, even if it killed her. And it did, in the end. If she hadn't played with people, she'd be alive today. There was a kind of madness about her that day. I suppose it could have been her kind of happiness. Please, please tell us what happened. I think the killer went up to Miss Jupp's room, desperate to find out the girl's intentions. Perhaps there was an idea of arranging a deal of some sort. Anyway, the visitor knocked and was let in. It was someone, you see, from whom Sally feared nothing. She would be in bed. She must have been sleepy, but she hadn't taken much of the cocoa and she wasn't drugged. Only too tired to be bothered with rational argument. You can't know what was said. We can guess. Sally was in love with her husband, looking forward to his return. But she adored secrets, the feeling of power they gave her. After all, this particular secret had given her a free home for seven months. Remember, St Mary's Refuge is for unmarried mothers. I think she enjoyed herself there. I bet she did. I can just imagine her relishing the thought of Miss Liddell's face when she learned the truth. But why didn't she tell you, Stephen? She'd have saved everyone a great deal of trouble. She'd have saved her own life. But was it in her character to tell? Her husband would soon be here. Dr Max's proposal was just extra excitement, a new complication, another chance of private amusement. I think that when her visitor came to her, she was lying back on her bed, sleepy, happy and confident, feeling perhaps that she held the Maxi family in the palm of her hand. Wretched girl. Yes. She wasn't a kind person, and I don't think she was kind to her visitor. I think she underestimated the force of the anger and desperation that were confronting her. Perhaps she laughed. <laughs> yes, I think she laughed. And that was the moment the strong fingers closed around her throat. You've missed your vocation, Inspector. You should be on the stage. Don't be a fool, Felix. Can't you see he's achieving precisely the effect he wants? Whose fingers, Dalgleish? Why go on with this farce? Whose fingers? Our killer goes to the door and turns out the light. And then, a moment of doubt. Is she really dead? Perhaps the child turns in his sleep. Whatever the reason, the light is switched on again for a moment. On, then off. Out there, under the trees, you, Mr Proctor, see the awaited signal. You make your way towards the back door. Yeah, it was open, just as she said. I switched on my torch and went up to her room. She showed me the way that afternoon. Her door was shut. There was no light showing. That struck me as odd. I didn't want to knock, so I opened it and called to her. She didn't answer. I shone the torch across the room and onto her bed. Funny how you can't mistake death. Sally was dead all right. I went in, closed the door and switched on the light. I went over and looked at her. Then I saw the bruise on her neck. 
Until then, I don't think the word murder had come into my mind. When it did, well, I suppose I lost my head. I made for the door. But you were too late, weren't you, Mr Proctor? You heard footsteps coming down the hall. Do you mean that when I knocked at Sally's door... It was you, was it? I just managed to pull the bolt when you knocked and called her. You went away after a bit, but I wasn't going to wait to see what happened. I switched off the light. And you got out of the side window. That's right, isn't it, Mr Proctor? Down the stack pipe. Only you fell. Oh, just the last few feet. I turned my ankle, though I didn't feel it at the time. I ran to where I'd hidden the bike and began to pedal home. Then I realised that I had to have an alibi. When I got to Finchworthy, I staged my accident. It wasn't difficult. I drove the cycle hard against a wall until the front wheel buckled. Then I slashed the tyres. I didn't need to worry about myself. I looked the part all right. My ankle was swelling by now and I felt sick. You must have got home well after one o'clock on Sunday morning. About a quarter past it was. Yet Mrs Proctor told us it was midnight. At half past eleven I'd gone to bed. I must have slept a little, but I got up when I heard him. It was midnight already. His face looked awful, streaked with blood, and he was shaking all over. I made him a cup of tea while he had a bath. It must have been half past twelve before we were in bed. He's still shaken up by it even now. Does that mean Mrs Proctor... No, no, she wasn't in on it. She knows nothing about it. I'd already worked out that I had to get in without disturbing her and alter the two downstairs clocks. We don't keep a clock in the bedroom, don't like the ticking. Anyway, as soon as I set foot in the door, she's calling down to me. By the time she got her dressing gown on and come downstairs, I put the clocks back to midnight. Oh, she fussed about getting me a bath and making tea. I was in a sweat to get her back into bed before the town clock struck two. It was the sort of thing she'd notice. Anyway, I did get her back upstairs eventually, and she went off to sleep quickly enough. Give me the chance to put the clocks back to the correct time. I never want to live through another night like that. If Sally felt hard done by, the little bitch got her own back that night. I shall need to talk to you again, Mr Proctor. Oh, please yourself. And now, if you don't mind, I'll be on my way. You don't want me here. I can see myself out. Thank you very much. Hasn't this gone on long enough? We've heard the evidence. That back door was unlocked until Stephen locked it at 12.30. Sometime before then, someone got in and killed Sally. The police haven't found out who and they aren't likely to. Could have been anyone. I propose that none of us says another word. You're suggesting that a perfect stranger entered the house, made no attempt to steal anything, went unerringly to Miss Jupp's room and strangled her. Meanwhile, she does nothing about raising an alarm, just lies back obligingly on the bed. She could have invited him to come. But she was expecting Proctor. She can't have wanted to make a party of that little transaction. And whom would she invite? I suppose you've checked on everyone who knew her. For God's sake, stop discussing it. Can't you see that's just what he wants us to do? But there's no proof. There's no proof against anyone. Well, we know who didn't do it anyway. It wasn't Stephen or Derek Pullen. They've got alibis. It wasn't Mr Proctor because of his hand. And Sally wasn't killed by Martha because she didn't know how the girl had died until Mr Hearn told her. Nor by you, Miss Bowers. You knocked at her door and tried to speak to her after she was dead. Nor by Mrs Risco, whose fingernails would inevitably have left scratches, and the murderer didn't wear gloves. Nor by Mr Hearn, no matter what he would like me to think. Mr Hearn didn't know which room Sally slept in. He had to ask Dr Maxey where he should carry the ladder. Only a fool would have shown that he knew. I could have pretended. Only you didn't. You were the last person who wanted Sally dead. With her installed here, Deborah might actually have married you. She never will now. <coughs> Mrs. Maxey, you have something to say? I went to her room to talk to her. I thought the marriage might not be such a bad thing if she were really fond of my son. I wanted to find out what she felt. She was lying on the bed, singing to herself. I was tired. I should have waited till morning. Even so, it would have been all right... If she hadn't done two things. Stephen, she told me she was going to have your child. My God. And she laughed at me. At us, the Maxies. She laughed. It was so very quick. One second she was alive and laughing. The next, 
that she was a dead thing in my hands. What are you doing? Packing. Why on earth did she confess, Catherine? Felix was right. They'd never have proved it if she'd kept quiet. Oh, you don't know her very well, do you? She was only waiting for your father to die. Well, they'll have to reduce the charge. It wasn't premeditated after all. But they'll send her to prison either way. Oh, Cathy, I can't bear it. You can't bear it. You don't have to. She does. And it's you who put her there. I don't know what you feel about me now, Stephen. But it doesn't matter anyway. I was in love with you once, but not any more. I hope you don't mind. I was passing. Come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink or tea or something? You're not on duty now, or are you? No. No, I'm not on duty. Just indulging myself. A whiskey, then? Thank you. Neat, please. There's only me here most of the time. Martha's left... A couple of the dailies come in from the village, but I'm afraid everything's getting rather shabby. Stephen is home most weekends. That helps. Of course, we'll have the house done over thoroughly well before Mummy comes back, but that's years away still. I seem to be in a sort of limbo. Ought you to be here alone? Oh, I don't mind. One of us has to stay. And how is Miss Bowers? Catherine... She comes down with James Ritchie most weekends to see the baby. I think they'll get married in the end. That's rather sudden, isn't it? Oh, I don't think Ritchie knows it yet. But she loves the child and cares about him. And the others? Felix Hearn is in Canada. Is he? Yes. I don't think he's coming back. May I? What? Come back? If you like. Would you like? Do you know? I rather think I would. In episode four of Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Teller, Robin Ellis played Dalgleish, Sean Phillips, Mrs. Maxey, Hugh Grant, Felix, Beatty Adney, Deborah, David Thorpe, Stephen, Una Beeson, Catherine, Gilly Mears, Mrs. Proctor, John Baddeley, Vic Proctor, Steve Hodson, Sergeant Martin, James Tulfer, Richie, Susan Sheridan, Johnny, Jill Graham, Martha, and Melanie Hudson, Sally. The director was Matthew Walters.